Hello, Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings on earth. Wow. We're going to focus our attention today on verses 4 and 5. But I wanted to read the whole passage again as we come to study it. Let's pray. Father God, I pray as we approach your words that we may do so with you, that we may hear with our hearts and see with our eyes and hear with our ears what you are saying to us in these days. In Jesus' name, amen. It's funny, uh, people's reactions as I say that I'm going to preach through the book of Revelation. I had one dear man say to me, gosh, you are brave. In 30 years of ministry, I I didn't touch it once. I have other people who, who have been traumatized by this book. It's all they ever heard growing up in church, all they were ever taught. The sermon smell of brimstone and uh, sulfur. And they were always looking for the signs of the beast or the antichrist. And then there are others who just say, well, it, it is utterly befuddling. I can't make head nor tail of it. Well, I want to say there's nothing for us to fear in this book. We're going to find the same Jesus in this book that we find throughout the Gospels. We're going to find hope and we're going to find truth and we're going to find that which will hold us in difficult days that which will reassure us and calm us and tell us again and again and again that the Lamb wins. That's so good. Not by strength, not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. The victory is God's and it will be not by might or by power, but by his spirit. Now, it is true that the book of Revelation is difficult at times to understand because of the type of literature that it is, this apocalyptic style of literature, which we remember means revealing, but it also does it through huge and beautiful and wonderful pictures and symbols. And there is great beauty in that. There is also a great emphasis on numbers in this book. There are numbers throughout 
And the numbers are, are beautiful. I, I could take you through them very quickly. So we have some of them in our heads and we're going to see at least two of them today. So the first number we find in the book of Revelation is the number three. It's not spoken out as many times as some of the other numbers, but it is there throughout this book. John writes in threes. So for example, in verse four, which we're going to look at in a little bit, to him who is, who was, and is to come. There is this threefold waltz, some people call it, of the way that it is written. Here's another one in verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud these words. Blessed is the one who hears these words. Blessed are those who keep these words. Keep what is written in it. This kind of threefold waltz, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. The revelation of God sent to Jesus, given to his angel. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And we're going to see that throughout because, of course, God, who is three in one, is central. This is a revelation about God, about Jesus Christ. So we'll see that. The next number that will appear, not in our passage today, is the number four. So we have the four corners of the earth or the four winds of the earth. And four will be symbolic of God's creation. We have the number seven, and we're going to see that today. Seven is the completeness, the fullness, the number of perfection. And we'll see that today as the number 10. And that's the number of completion. And then there's number of 12, which is the number of the people of God. Now, I'm not making up any of these numbers. This is not some great new interpretation from Andy Caldwell. This is understood, seen throughout scriptures, seen in the Old Testament as well as the New. There are 404 verses in the book of Revelation. That's it, 404 verses, over three quarters of them are direct or drawn out of or implications from the Old Testament. There is more Old Testament in the book of Revelation than any other book. It's incredible. So we do not need to fear this book as we come to it. We don't need to be afraid of it. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he will hold us as we read, and he will hold us as we step into our future. Remember, blessed is the one who reads this. Blessed is the one who hears this. Blessed is the one who keeps this. So let's read verse four. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia. So John, who was one of the 12, see that number there, 12 apostles, the people of God, the 12 tribes of Israel, the people of God. So John is the, the receiver ultimately of this revelation. God made it known to Jesus Christ. And Jesus made it known to John by sending his angel to him. To the seven churches that are in Asia. Now, this is our first time of seeing the number seven. So in our heads and in our hearts, we recognize something is going on here. Seven is mentioned Seven is the perfect 
number, the number of completion. It is a number to signify everything that is good, that is of God. And so on one level, we'll say this is John to the seven churches, to all the churches of God, to your church, to my church, to, to every church throughout history. This is to them. We're also going to see that it, there is an illiteral seven churches too that are representative of all the churches. And this letter is written to them. But it's also written for us as members of God's people, as members of God's church. There is truth here for us. It's from John to the seven churches that are in Asia, the, the coast of Turkey predominantly. John is in exile. He's actually in a penal colony. He's been arrested for his testimony, his preaching, his witnessing to the truth of Jesus Christ as being the Lord. Caesar is not Lord, but Jesus Christ is. And that's ended up with him being imprisoned for that. And he is separated from his people day after day. He would miss and long to be with his people. He would walk, so legend has it, to the very edge of the shore and look out to where Turkey is and pray and long to be with his people. Some scholars say that's why at the end of the book of Revelation, when he says, and there will be no sea, is because there'll be no separation. People won't be separated anymore in the new heaven and the new earth. These distances that separate such close people, these things that happen to us, that, that stop us communicating will be taken away and there will be real intimacy and love. So John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, and his first words are grace to you, peace to you. That's a really important word for those of us that are a bit nervous as we come to this book. Some who have heard that hell fire peaching. I remember when my dad came to faith in 2003 and into 2004, he, he said to me, he said, I never heard that Jesus Christ died for me. He said, I, I grew up in Scotland, in the Church of Scotland, and again and again and again, I was told about my sin. I was told about my punishment. I was told about my separation of God and my need for him. But I was never told that he died for me. I'm sure he was told that, but he never heard it. It's, it's amazing all the things that go on around us that we don't hear unless we tune into. And somehow my dad had never tuned into that truth, that God, that Jesus Christ died for him personally, individually. Augustine tells us that, that if he'd been the only person that had ever lived, that God loved him so much that he still would have sent his son and his son would have still, for the glory set before him, for the joy set before him, died in my dad's place for him. And that is really true. I want you to know this with every fiber of your being that when this is written, grace to you and peace to you, it is to you. It is 
for you as an individual. There is no distance that you can possibly be from God right now where this isn't true for you. And if you feel you are so far from him, well, just turn around just a little bit, like a mustard seed bit, and turn to him and allow him to come to you. Grace to you and peace to you. Now, if this was the Apostle John preaching on YouTube, this would be watched by everyone. If he was saying, even if it was a, a real or a sure, where the Apostle John just came and said, grace to you and peace to you, my children. We would tune in to hear that blessing and that grace. But it isn't even from, from John. Look what he says. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Do you see the waltz there of Revelation? Look at how he describes the one who is giving his peace and his grace to. The one who is. The one who is fully present. The one who at this moment holds the universe together by the word of his power. The one who is the great I am. The Lord of all the earth, the King of all kings, as we will read in a moment. The one who is. I don't know where you are as you, you hear this. But I am convinced by faith that God is with you just as he's with me now. I might not be able to see him. I may not be able to feel him. But by faith, I know he is here. Because he has said, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was. Recorded time, it is just a small thing compared to the infinity that is God. From everlasting to everlasting is how the, the psalmist puts it, that God in his being is infinite before anything ever came to be, God was complete. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit doing what G.K. Chesterton called the dance of, of mutual love, glorification, joy, enjoyment. God complete in himself from all eternity, stretching all the way before anything ever came into being. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, complete. And then we've got time. And God is. But God was. Before there was anything else, God was I am. And God it is fully present in the future. And the one who for all eternity will be from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And of course, that line, who is and who was and who is to come, is looking ahead to the very purpose and message of this book, which is that Jesus Christ is coming again, coming to put everything right. That's what justice means. Now we 
often get fearful of justice, but the very word justice means putting things right, restoring things. He will put everything right. And then he goes on. This isn't just grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, but there is a Trinitarian blessing here, a Trinitarian doxology. Doxology, long word, it means uh, glory words, words of glory. And so in this, we're talking about God and we're talking about the Holy Spirit too. Look what he says. From him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before the throne. Now here, John is giving a benediction from the Holy Spirit. He is talking about the Spirit of God. Now, straight away, we may be thinking to ourselves, well, hold on a second, there's only one Spirit of God. When Jesus spoke about giving the Holy Spirit, he said, it's good for you that I go so I can send you another. And the implication of that Greek word, alios, is another the same. Same as me, just like me, one who will run alongside you, parakletos, one who will come alongside you, who will be an advocate and a comforter to you, one just like me. As you've seen me act, so the Holy Spirit will act. So we know that there is one Holy Spirit. So why on earth here is John talking about the seven spirits of God? Well, well, the answer is very simple. It's to do with the completeness and the perfection of the spirit of God. So we remember seven is the number of perfection, of completeness, of wholeness. And so here we talk about the seven spirits of God as the complete, full, wonderful completion that is in God the Holy Spirit. He is completely God. He is not a lesser God to the Father and the Son. He is as perfect as God the Father, as perfect as as God the Son. He is perfect in and of himself. One God, three persons, all equal, all separate, one God. And so that's what he's saying. And this idea of seven, we'll find it again and again. This is uh, Revelation chapter five, verse six. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the spirit of God sent out unto all the earth. So this idea, seven horns, that would be the horn throughout scripture, and we see it particularly in the book of Psalms, has been used to denounce the strength of God. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my horn and my salvation. He's the strength of my life. That's what it is meant when we talk about horns, this strength or vitality that we would see in wild creatures. And so when the, when the lamb has seven horns, he has Perfect power, perfect strength. I'm so glad that it's a lamb with perfect power and perfect strength. A lamb reminded of Jesus when he says, come to me all you who are weary 
and I will give you rest. For I am meek and lowly. That's who I want to have all power. And then this lamb is like no other lamb that's ever lived because it's got seven eyes. And this is again perfect vision, perfect seeing, all seeing, all knowing, all perfect, all loving, incredible. You see the waltz at work there. And we're told this is the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now this language is language of the Old Testament, the seven spirits of God. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, we're told about the Spirit of God in a sevenfold way. We're told that he is the Spirit of Yahweh, the Spirit of the Lord. We're told it's the, the Spirit of wisdom. We're told it's the Spirit of understanding. We're told that it's the wisdom of counsel, the, wis- the, the Spirit of might the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of the fear of the Lord, this sevenfold identification of the spirit of God. And so this idea of the sevenfold spirit is one that's found in Isaiah, in the book of Zechariah. We're told the, the, the vision that Zechariah has of um Zerubbabel and uh, Joshua, who are, are standing before the throne of God. And there, in chapter 4, verse 10, we're told about the seven eyes of God. Again, which we see in Revelation 5, verse 6. All seeing, all knowing, perfect vision of the Spirit of God who is everywhere, all at once, perfect Spirit of God. So John writes, grace to you, peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come, and and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ. This is a Trinitarian doxology and blessing. Look what he says about Jesus. And we see our final waltz today. He says of Jesus, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and ruler of the kings of the earth. So not only is there Father, Spirit, and Son, when he talks about the Father, he is the one who is and who was and who is to come. When he talks about the Spirit of God, it's the sevenfold Spirit of God, utterly complete. And then he talks about Jesus, it's the threefold faithful witness. He poured himself out. He made himself nothing and spoke faithfully. He could have been king of all the earth. He could have had more fame, more adoration than anybody who'd ever lived. Yet he chose to speak faithfully. He could have saved his life before Pilate or Herod or Caiaphas, but he chose to speak faithfully. He spoke of what he'd seen and what he knew. He rose from the dead and spoke the truth to us that death is not the end. He was a faithful witness. He spent most of his ministry being laughed at and mocked and scoffed by those who should have received him. But he came to his own and his own received him not. He was the faithful 
witness, we're told. And he is the firstborn of the dead. Now that word firstborn, again, utterly biblical. We see it throughout scripture. The firstborn would be the most important. Now some people say, well, hold on a second. Surely uh, the widow of Nan's son was the firstborn from the dead. Or maybe the, the widow in Zarephath, who Elijah caused to be risen from the dead. Or, or Lazarus. Surely these were the firstborn from the dead. Well, firstly, they're not the most important person that's ever been raised from the dead. And secondly, their resurrection was temporal. Jesus' resurrection and your resurrection is eternal. So he is the first to have been raised to eternal life of which we will all follow. And as very God, he is the most important who has ever been raised from the dead. And finally, he says he is ruler of the kings of the earth. Ruler of the kings on earth. We look at this world with wars, Rumors of wars, earthquakes, volcanoes, instability, starvation, famine, climate chaos. We look at all these things and we feel so utterly helpless. But the truth is Jesus Christ is Lord. He is in control. And we do not need to fear. Even though in the weeks ahead, as we learn from this book, we will see some scary things. Tribulation, terror, the beast, the Antichrist. Even though we will see some frightening things happen. The truth is that Jesus Christ will remain as Lord and King. And the Lamb will win. So grace and peace to you from God our Father, from the Holy Spirit, and the King, Jesus Christ.